So this video isn't meant in any sort of uh, disrespect, but I watched uh, because someone who watches my stuff um, sent me a link to Rhett Scholl's video about how to make your HX Stomp Helix modeler sound more like a real amp. And I watched the, the video and it's good advice, but not for making your modeler sound like a real amp. Um, I'll go into some detail as to why I think that is, but basically the gist of it is that his advice is going to get you closer to a more refined, polished studio sound. Um, and I don't think that that is actually what people are looking for when they say, oh this doesn't sound like a real amp to me. One of the pieces of advice was to try putting a compressor at the end of uh, the chain after delay. Now that's not a bad idea. And but what that actually will do is increase the volume of the delay tail and it will squash essentially the volume of everything to whatever the compressor settings are. So your delay repeats will become louder than they would have if you had the compressor off. So that's a thing, it's not necessarily bad or good, but it's not necessarily getting you closer to a real uh, guitar tone. In fact, it's getting you closer to what would happen in the studio when you start to compress the overall guitar tone um, where everything actually becomes slightly less dynamic. It's not bad advice though, it's just that's what that's doing. The other thing quickly that he said about was that he, he was using the Kemper at this point and he said that there was frequencies in there that he doesn't hear when he's playing his real amp. Now I've never played his actual amp, but when you do play a real amp, what you'll find is that there's uh, resonant frequencies in the amp, uh, so there'll, there'll be notes in particular that will jump out uh, and they'll vibrate the cabinet, and you'll find that there's a few of those, so it might be like, I think I had one amp where it's like F, F sharp, and those notes are louder than other notes. You'll get, get things like cabinet, rattle, you'll get things like tube rattle, these are all natural, normal things for an amp. So if you go through and you EQ all of those out, you wouldn't generally be able to do that with a real amp. Um, it's not bad advice again, and it will get you a more refined, flatter response tone, but when you play a real amp, that isn't actually what you get. What you actually get is quite an idiosyncratic thing where uh, from one amp to the next you'll get different responses, you'll get, you know, boomy bass, and you'll get quite harsh highs. I don't know if you've ever played like a Vox AC30 really loud and with the speaker at your ear level, uh, a lot of high-end content there. Um, and if you start to EQ those out, I'd say you're getting further away from a real amp sound than if you didn't. Uh, you're getting closer to a studio representation of an amp sound. Um, and then the main thing that I would suggest is uh, the first thing that I kind of thought, well that's not how I necessarily consider these things, was that he was using the Global EQ um, and he suggested that that was a good way to um, start to tame in th that frequency response. One of his points was that uh, a guitar amp uh, doesn't necessarily respond all the way up to 20 kilohertz or down the bass end so he was using the global EQ to sort of tame that in and basically uh, bring that range of uh, tones within sort of uh, 8 kilohertz at the top end and then you know up to about 100, 100 hertz at the low end. Now this isn't bad advice it's good advice if you're in a studio environment, it's good advice if you're playing live. Uh, you don't necessarily want to compete with the bass, you don't necessarily want to compete with the bass and kick drums. From a production sense where you don't want uh, competing uh, instruments, so you try and keep bass and kick, uh, you have some separation there and then guitar you want out of the way of the bass and kick. I understand all that and that is really good advice for production really good advice if you're playing live as well but it's not getting you closer to a real amp sound because what you're doing if you look at a graph of what a guitar speaker response actually is there is content all the way up to 20 kilohertz 
and there is content all the way in the low end. And my main issue with this is that I've done gigs with in-ears and what is kind of crucial about that is that when you lose some low end response, that's when you lose a lot of feel for the guitar. So for me, you can try this yourself actually, but if you try, uh, for instance, going with in-ears and uh, do a gig with in-ears or do a gig with headphones or even just do it at home and try taking off the lower end, that for me is where the feel of the guitar actually matters. If you are on a gig and they shelve out some of those low frequencies like they would for the front of house, in your ears, for me I've found that that is really really unpleasant and you lose so much feel if they shelve off those low ends. Uh, often they'll go like as far as 500 hertz to, to get rid of those problematic lower end frequencies that compete with the bass and kick drum. Um, so that's why I would say if you want your modeler to feel uh, realistic like an amp, you, the last thing you want to do is shelve out too much of that bass content. And if you're using in-ears and headphones, possibly what you might even want to do is boost those if you're concerned that this thing is not feeling or sounding like an amp in the room. Part of what, for me, makes an amp in the room so lively is that low-end content that a 12-inch speaker is able to kick out into the room. In a studio environment or in headphones, you've got much smaller drivers and that's where you lose some of that bass response. Now, I agree with Rhett in that probably in a live scenario, it's not beneficial for everyone else for you to be kicking out loads of 50 hertz, 100 hertz content, but for it to feel right, you probably do need some of that. And particularly at home, uh, I find it useful to have some of that stuff in there. Uh, I'll just demonstrate a second. So here I've got a loop going and what I'm going to do is just gradually increase the low cut uh, on the global EQ. So you press in the two page buttons to get to a global EQ. Let me just do that. So press in the two page buttons, then press global EQ here and you'll see it come up. On the left hand side you've got a low cut, so it should be set to off by default. I'm gradually going to increase it. So it's at 20 hertz, at 50 hertz, at 100 hertz. Okay, and I'm going to go all the way up to 500 hertz. I wouldn't suggest that anyone would probably go potentially this high, although some sound engineers might. And hopefully you can hear the difference there. Um, it's not a it's not a substantial tonal difference necessarily, but it is a huge feel difference. And this, this is just in your headphones, you might be able to hear this. But if you imagine playing with this tone, it's a different thing altogether. And for me, feel is so important to have that bass content there. I'm just going to roll it back off, just as a demonstration. So all the way back up to 500 hertz, and now I'm going to kick it off completely. You may or may not agree, but to me, I think with that low cut off, it sounds and feels a lot more like a real amp than if you've got it on. Um, again, this is not to say that it's bad advice to use a low cut shelf. It's just to say that that isn't necessarily getting you closer to a real amp. A real amp does have problematic boomy frequencies in the low end. Uh, that's what makes you feel an amp. If you've got an amp behind you, a gig kicking at your legs, that's what you feel, it's those low frequencies. Similarly, in the high end, um, whilst I agree that a high cut can be useful, so he was using the, the global EQ for high cuts as well, uh, down to 8 kilohertz. And I'll just demonstrate this, the same sort of concept here. So I'm going to take it down to 8 kilohertz. So we're at 8 kilohertz now on the global EQ. Um, but if I kick it off again, hopefully you hear that that kind of lively sparkle is what gets cut off if you do go all the way down to 8 kilohertz. So down to 8 kilohertz again. We 
hear that, then that's the high cut off. So it's the same thing again, it's not bad advice, but if you do listen to a real amp, like I said, a Vox AC30, there's loads and loads and loads of high end content, way past 8 kilohertz. Um, this is where you find sparkle and air, that high end that you probably want when you're playing clean through an amp. So this is why I would suggest instead use the high cut on the cab block because you can then adjust via snapshots whether you have that high cut employed uh, for overdrive tones. For overdriven tones I absolutely suggest that um, a high cut is a way that you can tame off some of that harsh high end that does occur when you start to chuck drive in front of uh, an HX stomp or whatever you're using. But when it comes to the clean tones I'd say you probably want some of that high end content uh, way above 8 kilohertz, which is why on a lot of my tones if you go and look through them I'll have the high cut potentially even off uh, if you want in a strap bright sort of uh, tone there's stuff way past 8 kilohertz, which is useful for clean tones and semi driven tones even when it comes to a smooth gain lead tone I will use a high cut way down to even sort of 5-4 kilohertz. I'll use the cab block for that and snapshots. That's just my thoughts. Um, again, I didn't mean any disrespect to Retro. Uh, he's obviously way more experienced than me and on way bigger gigs than me. Um, but these are just my thoughts. If you want a realistic amp ta uh, tone, all of those uh, bits of advice that he gave are good advice for a more polished, studio ready tone that won't get in the way of other instruments and it'll be a more even um, smoother guitar tone that sits in a mix but it's not more like a real amp. A real amp has boomy low ends, it has harsh high ends, it has even spikes where uh, the cabinet shakes and rattles and you get uh, notes that bloom more than others. These are what make an amp an amp. Uh, an even response uh, with all of the problematic stuff EQ'd out will sound smoother and potentially will even sound better to your ears but it's not more like a real amp um, so by all means check out this video watch it it's really good advice in general it's just not necessarily if you're going well this thing that I've got here doesn't sound like a real amp to me if you stick a microphone in front of a Vox AC30 you will find there's lots of this harshness going on so the modeler is not adding things that other amps might not. Um, it's just acting how you would expect a real amp to react, in my opinion. Um, so by all means, check out Retro's video, do those steps, but you're getting closer to a more studio-ready, polished tone, um, which is not a bad thing. I would just say, if you're going to use the high cut, be careful if you're using clean tones or semi-driven tones because you will lose quite a bit of sparkle and you can really dull out a sound quite quickly if you do go as low as 8 kilohertz or beyond for a clean tone. It might be less of an issue if you're using humbuckers but for single players, single coil players like myself you do want some of that content above 8 kilohertz and even right the way up to 20 I'd suggest you don't necessarily need a high cut at all if you're um, not using quite a lot of gain. Um, that's just my thoughts. So leave your comments below and roast me and tell me that I'm an idiot. These are just my thoughts. Uh, hopefully you found something useful in this video. Um, if you leave your questions and comments below I can look at them. Um, thanks for watching.